Now, ladies and gentlemen, you'd better hang on tight for this next part, because I know from experience that the ground ahead gets pretty rough in places. Some of you are going to be shocked, and the rest probably scared right out of your wits, because I'm going to propose my own grand design. I call it the grand design for victory, and it's not for the faint-hearted. Step one in my grand design for victory is the premise that we must be captains of our own ship. We must restore our military, economic, and political independence from the strangling entanglements of that budding world government called the United Nations. Instead of phasing out our best weapons, we should phase out all disarmament programs and those who propose them. As we should have learned at Pearl Harbor, Disarmed and militarily unprepared nations are far more apt to become involved in war than those fully prepared to strike back. The best way to preserve the peace is to be prepared for war. And the best way to end the arms race is to move so far out in front that it ceases even to be a race. Now, instead of seeking ways to water down our principles and our traditions to the point where they can be accepted and merged with those of the majority of the world, we should be striving actually to improve and upgrade our American way of life even beyond present standards, and then let the rest of the world follow our example if they so wish. With regard to world communism, we must face up to the reality that whether we admit it or not, and whether we like it or not, we are now engaged in World War III, a total war in which the stakes are nothing less than our lives and our freedoms. And in this war, our goal must not be containment of or coexistence with communism. It must be victory over communism in order for us even to survive. It's not that we want it that way. It's just that we have no other choice. Now, before you nod in agreement with this goal of victory over communism, let me clarify just what that means. I'm not thinking in terms of those empty phrases and platitudes that so often fall from the lips of politicians. When I say victory over communism, I mean exactly that. Wherever the communists choose to advance by overt military force, whether that force manifests itself in the form of a Berlin blockade or a Vietnam guerrilla war of so-called national liberation, no matter what form it takes, it must be destroyed immediately by superior military force. And notice I didn't say checkmated, I said destroyed. International crime not only must be stopped, it must be punished. Now, of course, the question that rushes to mind at this point is, what about the danger of escalation? Ladies and gentlemen, the total objective of military warfare, once it breaks out, is to escalate it as rapidly as possible to beyond the endurance of the enemy so he'll quit fighting. Without escalation, the slaughter continues on and on with no end in sight, and in fact no goal worthy of the sacrifice. Come to the table, we say to the communist thugs. We mean you no harm. All we ask is that you stop killing people for a while, long enough for us to hold a conference to see if we can't negotiate something to you that you want. I wonder how many of you would be willing to give your lives for that. And yet, that is the goal for which we've asked over a million Americans in uniform to be willing to die if necessary. And I don't think it's worth a single drop of American blood. When you put a young man in uniform and ask him to face an enemy in mortal combat, You'd better give that boy every chance in the world to win so he can come home. And that, ladies and gentlemen, means escalation. In Southeast Asia, instead of fighting the communist forces on the ground in an exchange of manpower, we should have followed General MacArthur's proposal to take the war directly to the nerve centers of the enemy's home base using our superior air power. Fighting on the ground, man for man, against the limitless population reserves of communist Asia is just about the only way the United States possibly could lose a war. Destroy from the air the sources of supplies and leadership. Then the guerrilla fighting on the ground 
would soon wither to no more than a local police problem. When the enemy suddenly realizes that the cards are no longer stacked in his favor, that he no longer has privileged sanctuaries, and that he might even stand to lose something for starting a war, he'll come to that peace table so fast it'll make your head swim. And when he gets there, there's only one thing we discuss with him, his surrender terms, nothing else. Now, any serious plan for victory over communism must recognize the need to accept the help of all willing and trustworthy allies. Yet in Korea, and again in Vietnam, the nationalist Chinese have begged us to accept over a half a million of their well-trained, fully equipped, strongly motivated troops, either to fight alongside our boys or to replace them altogether. And we decline to accept. Why? Well, of course, it's not really so hard to understand when you recall the grand design. If the nationalist Chinese were ever allowed to get into what is basically their own battle against Red China, they just might get an uncontrollable urge to go home to the mainland. They might not stop when they got to the Yalu or the DMZ. In fact, they might even try to win, and that would ruin everything. <laughs> but that is precisely my point. Instead of cowering and trembling in fear at the dreaded possibility of Red China coming into a war, we should hope and pray that the anti-communist Chinese and Koreans and Vietnamese would drag Red China into a war, screaming and kicking, and then by triggering internal revolts, liberate her people from the yoke of communist slavery once and for all. And we mustn't back away from this one bit if we're really serious about victory. For our goal must not be merely to keep the communists out of South Korea or South Vietnam. That isn't victory, that's containment. It must include removing the communists from North Korea, North Vietnam, Red China, Cuba, Eastern Europe, and from the very first captive nation, Russia itself. Just as we could not rest in World War II until every last vestige of Nazism was stamped out everywhere, for ten times that reason, we can never hope today to have peace or security until every last communist regime is removed from the face of the earth. It's not that we want it that way. It's just that we have no other choice. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if this sounds risky, it's because it is. Let's not kid ourselves. The proposal I have just outlined is very risky business. The only thing more risky is the grand design we are now following. For if we continue on that course, we have no odds at all for our survival. Now this doesn't mean that we have to invade all these countries with soldiers. And it certainly doesn't mean that we should go around dropping the bomb on everybody. And if you're thinking that this is what my proposal implies, then that's a pretty good indication that you're still thinking in terms of old-fashioned warfare. Now, it's true that occasionally, whenever the conditions seem right, the communists do resort to brute force and semi-military tactics to advance their cause. When this happens, then the contest clearly must be won with military means. But because of the very nature of communist strategy, these hot spots never have and never will be more than diversionary tactics to implement the larger strategy in the total war, which is predominantly non-military. Just as we are losing this war through non-military means, if we ever hope to win it, we'll have to do so through exactly those same non-military means. Let me give you a few quick examples of how this can be achieved. First of all, and the most obvious of all, we must stop all trade and aid to communist regimes. Let these so-called socialist paradises try to exist on their own unproductive and bureaucracy-bound systems for a change without being able to run to Uncle Sugar every time they're in trouble and see how long they'd last. I don't think they'd last two years. Now, secondly, I propose that we recognize all communist regimes recognize them, that is, for what they are, our mortal enemies. And if we do that, then we withdraw diplomatic recognition from them, no longer invite their leaders to dine in the White House, and we send...